shell shock. Most veterans, they didn't understand what was going on. The military authorities were concerned about manpower. They didn't want to actually have anybody um, diagnosed with any kind of problem that might take them off the battlefield. So essentially it became a matter of do your duty, be quiet. Um, if you have a problem, just ignore it, soldier on, you'll be fine. And what you saw back in the First World War is the same as what you see today. Uh, men and women pushing themselves too far to the point where some of them just, they cracked and they ended up as casualties on the battlefield. And unfortunately, after the war, they weren't given the same kind of sympathy. Shell shock on the battlefield meant different things to different people. If you could divide it generally into two different theories, there was that it was a physical jarring of the brain, hence the term shell shock, a shocking shock to the brain from from a shell or from some other kind of, you know, concussion of some kind. Then you had the psychological side, which developed sort of starts around the middle point of the war, and then by the end of the war, you have more, more medical officers and more civilian practitioners talking about it from a psychological standpoint. There was never really a full understanding of exactly what it was. By the end of the war, there are two theories, but there are still two different camps, and they don't really come to a consensus on it. When they got back, um, essentially, shell shock became sort of a, a symbol as well as a medical diagnosis. As the war became distant and as the Canadian public started thinking of the tragedy and, and the sort of mass trauma, shell shock then came to symbolize that sort of collective grief, that collective trauma, rather than just being an individual wound. So it was sort of became, for shell shocked veterans, it became an individual thing, but for society, it became a a larger thing. There's this sense of mass trauma, mass grief. And certainly any time I've given presentations about this subject, I always get someone come up to me afterwards in the audience and talk about a father, a grandfather, an uncle, who was never the same after the war. And in some cases, you do get stories about how that manifested in, in various behaviors. So whether it's, um, you know, grandpa sometimes woke up choking grandma in his sleep because he was reliving the war in his, in his dreams, or whether you'll get some, some kind of behaviors at work. You know, they couldn't hold a job because he once in a while would just explode on his coworkers and they were worried that he might get violent. There was a sympathy in the public that people knew people weren't right because they didn't know exactly what it was and because there was a large stigma still towards mental illness particularly. Mental illness was something that society in general did not want to discuss. So it became sort of a matter of tolerate the behavior and sort of, you know, unless it gets really bad, just kind of leave them to their own devices. And from the, the veteran's perspective, nobody wants to be singled out or, or be seen as unwell. So I think a lot of them either didn't understand or if they did understand, uh, they, I'm sure they knew it was related to the war on an intuitive level. They just sort of tried to get on with their, their, their day and their job and hope that it just got better with time. And in a lot of cases it did. That's how, you know, the human mind is very resilient. In a lot of cases, they picked up and, and moved on. But you hear lots and lots of anecdotal stories. I mean, I can't even count the amount I've heard at this point from people. You know, my, my own grandfather, the book is dedicated to, to him. Um, after the Second World War, was never the same. And nightmares all the way, uh, recurring, you know, sporadic, but recurring nightmares all the way up until the end to do with the war. And there were an occasional comments he would make to my mother and my grandmother, sort of, uh, very quick offhanded references like it was either him or me or those kinds of things that gave you a sense of why what was what was still troubling him kind of all those decades later but I think the biggest problem going all the way back to the first world war and after is that it's one thing to talk about stigma it's another thing to try and deal with it and the silence I think largely comes from the fact that society even then was willing to at least address it a little bit but not enough to actually get them the help or not enough to actually normalize it to make them feel that what they were dealing with it was a normal reaction to war the soldiers when they when they go to these operations and military life in general they really essentially they they develop comrades and they, the experiences they have together become sort of one of the, the their self-definitions from then on and so what happens is, is when they come back, they don't want to talk about it with anybody other than their comrades because they, one is that they feel like nobody will understand except the people that were there. But with psychological injuries, because we're just not quite there yet with the research and the science and things, we have a whole history and a whole legacy in Canadian society also, well, throughout the Commonwealth, et cetera, um, of veterans who started, went as young men, 
weren't, didn't even fully know who they were yet and came back a different person. And I think in a lot of cases, that's why you get that sort of archetypal story of the war was the biggest event of their life. And I, I think even for the ones that came back and didn't necessarily come back heavily traumatized or at least end up having a medical diagnosis, it still changed them in a way forever. One of the, I think, the big legacies of First World War and, and more recent ones is this idea that talking about trauma, talking about shell shock, helps to show that no war is good and wars don't end when the last shot is fired. Mentally, they go on for some participants for the rest of their life. <laughs>